Hello and welcome to Orwellian, the podcast dedicated to the essays of George Orwell. When you hear the word Orwellian, what do you think of? State surveillance? Terrifying dystopias? The loss of personal freedom? Well, we think of tea, pubs and the common toad. Join us and we'll tell you why. Welcome back everyone. My name is Lewis and I'm here with my co-host. Simon. And this week we're talking about another George Orwell essay, quite a short one this week. But before we start, Simon, how are you doing? I'm doing honestly well. How about yourself, Mr Hurst? I'm also doing honestly well, thank you. I'm drinking some rather interesting Belgian beer. Yeah. Um, how would you describe this beer, Simon? Um, Delicieux. Uh, Pecheresse. It's a Pechlambic artisanal beer. C'est pas fort. Is that right? <laughs> what is pas fort? It's not strong. Ce n'est pas fort. I'm afraid your French is beyond mine. Um, in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> <laughs> I just know that... Uh, Some good old GCSE French coming out. I just know that it's rather sweet and unusually for Belgian beer, quite weak. You know, I've always been a bit hesitant about Belgian beer since a, a, a rather bad experience at university. <laughs> uh, when I was drinking, do you know Duvel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Duvel which means devil in, uh, I believe, Flemish. Um, I, I was drinking Duvel to celebrate after an exam once, and I didn't realise that it was something like 9 or 10%. And uh, I didn't realise at the time, but I realised the next morning that it was a lot stronger than yeah. I thought it was. We, we used to call Stella Artois, which is the most commercial of Belgian beers, we used to call it Stella Artois, <laughs> due to its effects on us after enough of it. Is it strong, Stella Artois? It's not, but it's about 1 or 1.5% above your average English beer you're drinking as a student, such mm. as Carling and Carlsberg, Heineken. All those English beers. <laughs> yeah. Well, Carling. Is Carling? It's Carling. Carling an English lager. I think so. But they're all about 3.8, I think. And Stella Artois is about 5 and, it, it well and when you've had 10, that makes a difference. It well and truly twatted you. Yeah. Um, I think we can say that, can't we? <laughs> but uh, this is not the beer review podcast. This nope. is the Orwellian podcast. And this week, we're talking about the essay, Just Junk, But Who Could Resist It? Uh, it's not about the contents of Simon's flat, despite what you might think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you've been so nice to me this evening as well. <laughs> Made me dinner and everything. Um, but I had to get in there. Um, it was the Saturday essay in the Evening Standard, uh, 5th of January, 1946. Simon, what did you make of this essay? Well, we were discussing this before, and um, I I'll just be honest about this and come out with it. I didn't enjoy it. It's not one of my favourites. It doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't spark anything within me. I, I found it a bit... I didn't get any nuances. I didn't see any allegorical meaning behind it. But you promised you would change my mind throughout the podcast. So let's go. I'm open-minded. Well, you know, this is one actually one of my favourite George Orwell essays. And it's one of the Crikey. ones which I, I think I say this... <laughs> Almost every week, uh, but uh, it, <laughs> I can't it, wait to hear your the one you don't. Like. <laughs> um, Blank page. It's um, it's an essay which means a lot to me for personal reasons, okay. and I do think that it's an essay like a lot of the essays we've looked at while we've been doing this podcast. It's an essay which originally was just something I enjoyed, but now that I read it uh, in a more nuanced way I, I find myself understanding more about it and we'll get on to this later but I think it's safe to say there is no such thing as a non-political George Orwell essay and I think we will come to see the politics in play in this essay later but just to sum this essay up it is about junk shops and Orwell's love of junk shops now Simon what do you think of when you hear the phrase junk shop? I was trying to think, what are they today? Is it a second-hand shop, what we'd call it today, or a charity shop even? 
Well, I think that in a way the junk shop has rather been succeeded by charity shops yeah. and secondhand shops. Um, one of the reasons that this essay means a lot to me is because when I was growing up in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and we used to visit Edinburgh, which was the nearest city to my hometown, um, Edinburgh at that time was full of junk shops. And I used to go in well, on... No one in England was shops. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Touché. <laughs> one all. One all. So Edinburgh was full of junk shops. And I used to go in to Edinburgh at the weekend with my mum or dad or my brother. And we would go to these... They were almost sort of... This was, like I say, this was only 20, 30 years ago. But they were almost kind of Dickensian spaces simon they would be these dank often you know subterranean in cellars you know these shops um there would be like an old man or an old woman huddled up in the corner i swear sometimes one or two of them still had coal fires and um they would just be you know the the owner as as orwell mentions in his essay the owner would just be dozing in the shop and then uh my dad if i was in with my dad he'd maybe look, be looking for some old tools for his projects that he couldn't buy anywhere else <laughs> or uh, my mum would be looking for curios or my brother would just be perusing for knickknacks and they were the most amazing and Isn't unusual. Is you got your pocket watch? <laughs> no it's not I got that in uh, Japan but uh, one day it might end up in a junk shop um, <laughs> but anyway they were these amazing kind of out of time spaces and I think that's one of the reasons Orwell liked them but I also think there's very much a political element to this essay. I think this essay says a lot about uh, the, the economy at the time Orwell was writing, so 1946, right after the war. And I think it says a lot about capitalism, because coming back to Edinburgh, Edinburgh was full of these curious shops when I was a child. But these days, rents have gone up. Edinburgh's become a very touristy place. And it is not viable to run businesses like this anymore. Uh, so Orwell starts off talking about how the junk shop is often found in unsalubrious neighbourhoods. He mentions parts of London which, well, these days, again, with uh, the rise of neoliberalism, have become a bit more uh, fashionable and a bit more expensive. He mentions neighbourhoods that were at that time less fashionable, Greenwich, Islington, Holloway, Paddington. And he makes was the Islington point... Was Islington once upon a time unfashionable? Yes, yes, it was. Crikey, um, I imagine. And uh, he mentions how, and I'm quoting Orwell here, I have never seen a junk shop worth a second glance in what is called a good neighbourhood. Now, Simon, didn't that strike you as very telling? It did, and it made me think, and... I spent a few summers in Glasgow, and if you go up on Buchanan Street and places like that, there's a lot of charity shops. And then you go out to the west end of Glasgow, there's not so many. And then I thought about other towns in the East Midlands where I grew up, places like Corby and Kettering, absolutely full of them, full of charity shops. You go to Bath, Oxford and Cambridge, you show me where the charity shops are in the centre. So. And you'd think the wealthy have more things to give away for free, wouldn't you? Obviously, it works the other way around. I was always told that a charity shop, uh, the presence of a charity shop on a high street was a sign that the high street was in trouble. Yeah. Um, especially if there's more than one charity shop. On oh, yeah. I mean, high street. you go into the high street of Corby, there's a lot. And there's no Starbucks. Which is the opposite, isn't it? And they're Starbucks all, they're is all the sign of gentrification. They're all full of trouser presses. I mean, Starbucks is eff eff effectively a junk shop. It's just the man who has a Starbucks app on his phone. Yes. <laughs> I, I remember whenever I need to meet you in town and I wonder where you are, I gen generally do head to the nearest Starbucks. But in, in defence of that is because I often need Wi-Fi ah, for true. my work. So I'm the only coffee shop in Tokyo that has it. Another interesting thing that Orwell mentions is he, he makes a distinction between the junk shop and the antique shop. Did you like that bit? The, about how a junk shop is not to be, again, quoting Orwell here, a junk shop is not to be confused with an antique shop. Yeah. 
An antique shop is clean. Its goods are attractively set out and priced at about double their value. There's capitalism coming in. <laughs> and once inside the shop, you are generally bullied into buying something. Going into antique shops, I have the same attitude as to when I'm going through a souk in Marrakesh or Istanbul or a city like that, in that I know if I purchase something, I'm paying over the odds because you know you're not going to win. They'll make you think you've won, but you're not going to win. You're going to pay over the odds. Hence, I don't like going in them nowadays. I must say, I've always rather liked antique shops, but again, I've always, like Orwell, kind of graded antique shops based on how fancy they look inside. Because I know if I go into a pristine one um, where there's lots of, you know, antique crockery and uh, various fragile-looking curios, I know that as soon as I go in, the owner is going to start hovering around me and making conversation. And again, this is Edinburgh is full of antique shops, and there were those antique shops when I was growing up. But conversely, in a junk shop, can I just interrupt? There's an antique shop near here, and in the window, so this is the centre of Tokyo, or near near enough. And there's an antique shop near here, and in the window they have an old globe mm. made of wood and with in Japanese. Oh God, I'd like to purchase that, but too afraid to go in. And you can't see the price through the window. Nah, too afraid to go in and ask. That's the problem with antique shops because often you're afraid to even go in because you know that you are going to be hounded. Well, if I get fleeced at an antique shop in England, what's going to happen to me here? Exactly. They'll definitely <laughs> see you coming. I probably won't have a house by the <laughs> by the time I've left, but I'll have a globe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Orwell mentions how, you know, antique shops, you're pressured into buying things. But he then writes, a junk shop has a fine film of dust over the window. <laughs> its stock may include literally anything that is not perishable. And its proprietor, who is usually asleep in a small room at the back, displays no eagerness to make a sale. Now, again, this is uh, very much like my experiences of junk shops in Edinburgh when I was growing up. But Simon, didn't this strike you as being a kind of very much Orwell's comment on capitalism and on the nature of capitalism? How you go into an antique shop and you're bullied into buying something you don't really need. But the junk shop is set up in opposition to that, where, you know, you just go in of your own free will. You wander around and you buy something only if you particularly want it. Or so what's the junk shop it? representing if the... If the antique shop is capitalism. Well, I wouldn't say that the junk shop is anti-capitalism because it's still part of the capitalist system. But could we say, you know, Orwell was always very much on the side of humanity over systems. Is Orwell saying that the junk shop is a more humane form of capitalism where, you know, the owner can have a rest in the back at their will and, you know, you as the customer are not pressured into spending your money. But, what, I mean, what we've got to get into the essence of capitalism. What is capitalism? It's, it's paying for the purchase of goods which represent the, the work put into their value. So the production and the time and the materials made to produce that good is then represented in its value and hence its purchase, which is exactly what you're getting in an antique shop. These are intricately made materials which have been made with the best materials, hence you're paying a higher price, whereas a junk shop is things that are unwanted, hence you're paying a lower price. Unwanted, but often necessary, because Orwell goes on to say that... You're telling me a, a, a faux Roman vase is not necessary? Well, I suppose you could put some flowers in it or something. I mean, I mean, you, I mean your globe is obviously quite necessary, yet you haven't bought it yet. <laughs> necessary, in case I forget where I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Orwell goes on to mention how, you know, the, the junk shop contains this kind of mishmash of stuff. And I think... Tat. Well, I get the impression <laughs> that this might have been one of the reasons you weren't keen on this essay, because a lot of it is just lists of things right yeah. um so he mentions how uh, just give an example of one of these like these lists yeah. um so also quoting orwell also its finest treasures are never discoverable at first glimpse 
They have to be sorted out from among a medley of bamboo cake stands, Britannia ware dish covers, turnip watches, dog-eared books, ostrich eggs, typewriters of extinct makes, spectacles without lenses, decanters without stoppers, stuffed birds, wire fire guards, bunches of keys, boxes of nuts and bolts, conch, shell conch shells from the Indian Ocean, boot trees, Chinese ginger jars and pictures of highland cattle. Why would you buy a bunch of keys? Well, Orwell goes on to say later in the essay that sometimes... It can fit any lock. It can fit any lock. <laughs> is, that, course, is, that, is that true? Well, we have to remember these are the days before, or the early days of Yale Keys. It was only sort of around the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, when they started to make very, very precise keys. And with the old-fashioned locks, you could sometimes open... Uh, you know, is it like using a skeleton key? You could... So junk shops were a den of criminal initiative. Well, you could uh, you could interpret it that way, but you could your, also your your perusing of capitalist purism starting to fall away. <laughs> no, I would say that what Orwell is saying is that you can go to a junk shop to get the things that either you can't get new, or that if you do buy them new, they are. Or if you buy them in a fancy antique shop, they're, they're horrendously overpriced. What, what I did relate to is when he says he bought an old sword, which he used as a fire um, stoke? Poker. Poker, poker. Um, and I can relate to that. I, I would buy a sword if I saw it and I could afford it and find a use for it. I just think in this essay, Orwell is saying that the junk shop is a place you can go to escape from the kind of uh, rampant profiteering of the uh, antique shop. And it's also a place where the people can go to get things that they need, especially in this time after the war. He mentions how uh, during the last few years, the junk shop has been the only place where you could buy certain carpet carpentering tools, again reminding me of my dad very much, um, a jack plane for instance, or such useful objects as corkscrews, clock keys, skates, wine glasses, copper saucepans and spare pram wheels. Most of those things, apart from skates, I'm not sure what that's about, but most of those things are useful day-to-day -day items which after the war, in a time of rationing, were very hard to come by. And Orwell, this yeah, is... Yeah, like lensless spectacles and um, ostrich eggs. Well, no, no, I but just that... don't know what Britain would have done. No, but no, but actually, Orwell earlier. I did not have those. Listen, you're you're being too selective. Here and, and, the, and the Mandarin ginger jars. I mean, come you're, on. Wait, wait, you're we, being. We wouldn't have had the Roaring Fifties had it not been for those. You're being too selective because <laughs> things like the ostrich eggs and the stuffed birds and all that—that that was what Orwell was saying was useless. Well, but he then... mentions one junk shop, which is just scrap metal. Yes, but scrap metal could be valuable after the war. And he says that, as long as I can remember, the same worn out tools and lengths of lead piping have been lying in the doorway. Uh, I've never bought anything here, never even seen anything that I contemplated buying, yet it would be all but impossible for me to pass that way without crossing the street to have a good look. The point is that the, the customer goes into the junk shop on their own terms. They interact with the goods in the junk shop on their own terms. They're not pressured into buying anything. They're not pressured into paying above the odds for anything. In fact, they often buy things that they really need uh, that they're getting much cheaper than they would get elsewhere. And that's why Orwell likes it, because it's a space where the people, the ordinary people who don't have the money to go to antique shops or don't have the money to buy things new, can go to get what is necessary in their lives. Wouldn't, wouldn't you prefer it if the allegorical meaning here was about something which was more aspirational about self-improvement about hope well rather than you've got nothing your, your situation's pretty poor oh here's a place that will be okay for you well listen uh like a, a book i mean i think we'll do an essay in the future about working in a bookshop right but you know a bookshop i much prefer that essay about people going around a bookshop, a second-hand bookshop, books they can afford, self-improvement, knowledge. But the point is... Not an ostrich egg. D Orwell never says anyone needs ostrich eggs. 
Um, you say I'm being selective, <laughs> or he's being very selective as to, as to what the usefulness of a jump shot. But honestly, imagine, you know, it's 1946, the war is just over, rationing still on, it's winter, this was published in winter, 1946, your baby's pram is falling apart, you need a spare pram wheel, you read this essay and you think, oh, I could just go to a junk shop to get this, you know, I can make do and mend, I can do the best I can in tough circumstances. The very name of it, a junk shop, what was the connotation of the word junk? Well, uh, this is something I was going to mention. Not useful. Yes, but the point is that Orwell thinks this is very much what you like. You know, you always like to say Orwell celebrates the unsung, the downtrodden. Yeah. And this essay is all about Orwell celebrating uh, junk and saying, actually, you know, even though the word junk means something useless or even something ugly, but it's he, that all of this is really useful He never stuff. celebrates the downtrodden. He raises awareness of. Well, that's what he's doing in this essay. This essay is so celebratory towards something which is junk. I, I don't. I just don't like the the metaphor. I don't think it ties in with his usual narrative on the downtrodden and the working class. It doesn't work for me. This one. But but this is he's writing about how this is a space where the downtrodden and the working class can get what they need uh, for not much money. The working man's club. The pub. Are they going to go and buy their necessities there? Escapism. Well, yes, that's escapism. I like that message of the downtrodden. And... But this, is, this isn't this is about escapism. This is about the practicality of daily yeah. life, which is more important than escapism. And it's about how you can... And it's also when it was written. It's written in 1946. I also think I would have a different view of this had it been written in 1938, before the war, as opposed to after the war. And then during the war, weren't they crying out for scrap metal and lead to mm. be donated and melted down? So it's all done in junk shops in 1946. Well, that's Why a, were they hoarding war materials? That's an interesting point. Um, often, I, I have read historians these days saying that a lot of that scrap metal actually was never used in the war effort. It was just kind of... Put in shops by the sounds mm, of it. <laughs> from the sound of it, yeah. Let me ask you a question. Why didn't the ostrich egg ever hatch because I think it had been <laughs> um, so and what's inside if you open that up um, have you ever a baby ostrich with a cane <laughs> like Benjamin Button <laughs> of, of, of the ostrich world um, have you ever uh, painted Easter eggs yes did you not? Did your did your mum and dad not show you what you need to do before you paint the Easter egg? How you need to prick a hole in the bottom of the egg and get rid of the yolk? You're looking at me like I'm speaking Dutch. <laughs> I don't remember that. No. Um, this was some something I was taught. You know, you to if you want to keep an eggshell and paint it, you've got to prick a hole in it, drain the yolk out, and then paint it. So that was what was done with the ostrich egg. It was never fertilised. You killed a life for your artistic endeavour. Listen. Lewis Hurst. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't, I won't put my head in the sand on that one. Oh, that's good. That's good. Anyway, I think this is getting a bit too emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking Rod Hull now. <laughs> Go to Hull. <laughs> I'm very surprised by your reaction to this essay because I think that this is in the same way that you know that the moon underwater is, in the same way that his defense of English cooking is, I think this is a celebration of working class culture. Yeah, I don't know, I just disagree. I, I just find in his other works where he celebrates working class culture or without meaning to sound demeaning, celebrates the mundane. Well, this is mundane. Yeah, I don't put this in that category, because when he celebrates pubs or English cuisine, he's celebrating something in defence of or in opposition to snobbery. Well, In fact, in, in, in the way that you don't feel you can enjoy this because of its association with the class. Whereas junk shops are a, a, a necessity of desperation. You know, I, I just categorise it differently. 
Well, yes, but you say that it's... But, I mean, it's all about how you interpret, and like you say, this is very personal to you. I, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever been to a junk shop in the way you described it in your childhood in Edinburgh. I've just been to the modern version, like charity shops, and I find them very... I don't know. I mean, obviously, they're for a good cause, raising money for charity, but I always just find it very... Sad? Sad, yeah. Have you never taken pleasure in finding a real bargain or some real curio in a charity shop? You know, a book? Oh, I spent my twenties, all my clothes throughout my twenties were bought from charity shops. And now I give all my stuff to charity shops, but I still find it sad when I'm there looking at the people in there and how they, that's the only place they can shop. And in the name of charity for a various cause, such as cancer, but I'm thinking, where, where is the charity here? For me, the charity is in the people that are forced to shop in these places. Well, I suppose... And it, it's, it's a consequence, whereas I always prefer to focus on the cause. Whereas in these other essays, I believe the focus is more on the cause and the awareness, as opposed to accepting the consequence. I suppose this is something we should mention. Um, I, I said earlier that the number of junk shops in Edinburgh has declined, and of course that's partly due to rents, that's because the old folk who were it's running them... It's a very gentrified city yes. centre, isn't it? Isn't uh, it? And the old folk who were running them died, and you know they, either they didn't have children or their children didn't want to... I mean, really, who these days wants to say I'm the proprietor of a junk shop? But um, I think another reason they've not survived is because they were very much uh, hangover from... The Victorian era and very much a hangover from a time of you know rapid urbanization. I, I remember reading a great book about the Victorian underworld and it had a lot of detail about the second-hand shops you would find in places like the East End in London. Oh, I can and, imagine a Victorian second-hand shop. Mm, that would be interesting. Um, and so I think that these uh, these junk shops were really, the, the ones I was going to in the 90s and early 2000s in Edinburgh, I think they were very much a kind of hangover from that time. And I suppose you're right, if you think about the causes behind the creation of the junk shop, they come from a period of, you know, a great amount of poverty yeah. and people not being able to buy new goods. But is, is junk shop not just a, a romanticised pawn shop? Please, please show your working. <laughs> P A W N Lewis, calm down. Do you see what I mean? Like, I see what you mean. A glorified pawn shop. But, but what does a pawn shop represent? Well, exploiting the the poor. That's true, but again, that kind of shop, you know, you'd take in something and you'd get a ticket, and uh, you might be able to get it back. But a junk shop, you would. Not the pawn shops I go to. <laughs> yes, you don't want those back. <laughs> At least not until they've been thoroughly wiped down. Um, oh, too much. <laughs> oh, come on. Too much. In Spain, they have a lot of what are called, in, in, in typical Spanish uh, knowledge of the globe, called chinos, mm. which translates as Chinese. And they're Chinese shops run by Chinese people. And they're basically these huge shops with names such as Aladdin's Cave, Dragon's Den, basically full of tat, pretty much a junk shop, except everything in it isn't junk, it's new made in Chinese factories by people earning about one dollar a week and then sent over to Europe and sold like poorly made products. You go in there and get a pack of batteries for 50p kind of thing or you can buy a, a, a dining room chair for a fiver. Yet it's all newly made. That's the modern day junk shop. But and, and what's that representing apart from slave labour in China? Yes, but that's... that's... And putting independent businesses out of out of business because they can't keep up with us at ridiculous prices. But that's new stuff and Orwell here is writing about how the junk shop sells old stuff and how often within the junk shop you can find real gems. But but why are people using junk shops in 1946? Well, rationing. To find stuff that they can't afford in other shops. Exactly why people are using these chinos in Spain. To buy the stuff they can't afford to buy in Ikea and other shops. Exploiting. Exploiting the concept of poverty. But I would say that the these chinos are 
um, exploiting the concept of poverty because that stuff's being made new. But the junk shops in Orwell's time but are poverty of the people buying, not the people who made. The junk shops in Orwell's time are performing an important service to people. So are the chinos. But people can't. Not everyone can afford to go and buy a dining room table in IKEA. But they can afford one from the Chinese shopping. Yes, but who's being exploited in the case of Orwell's junk shops? They exist for people who can't afford to buy products which are new. And, and it improves the lives of those people because they can buy them cheaper buying, there. Buying tat that somebody previously didn't want. It's not, chat, it's not tat, like Orwell says, useful objects. Chinese ginger jar. Useful objects. Tools, carpentry tools. Give us another screws. list. There's a few lists. Okay, Read out um, another list randomly. Okay. Uh, so. And if it's um, useful, I'll say I. If it's okay. not, I'll say nay. <laughs> Go slowly. Musical boxes. Nay. Horse brasses. Nay. Copper powder. Oh, horns. nay. Horse brasses. Sorry. Anyway. Nay. <laughs> Jubilee mugs. <laughs> Double nay. Glass paperweights. <laughs> nay. Uh, okay. How about? Um, <laughs> I've approved my point. <laughs> and next list. How about right? How about the bit about the scrap screen? I love the bit about the scrap okay. screen because it gives us a real insight into Orwell's home life. Uh, again, I'll quote here: "Scrap screens, all too rare in our days, are simply ordinary wooden or canvas screens with coloured scraps cut out and pasted all over them in such a way as to make a more or less coherent picture." The best were made around about 1880, but if you buy one at a junk shop, it is sure to be defective, and the great charm of owning such a screen lies in patching it up yourself. You can use coloured reproductions from art magazines, Christmas cards, postcards, advertisements, book jackets, even cigarette cards. There is always room for one more scrap, and with careful placing anything can be made to look congruous. Thus, merely in one corner of my own scrap screen, Suzanne's card players, with a black bottle between them, are impinging on a street scene in medieval Florence, while on the other side of the street one of Gauguin's South Sea Islanders is sitting beside an English lake where a lady in leg of mutton sleeves is paddling a canoe. They all look perfectly at home together. I think that this bit about the scrap screen, first of all, it's a wonderful insight into Orwell's home life. Is, it, it, is it the, the, the old Etonian showing us how working class and thrifty he is? Well, this is something I did want to ask you about, because do you think that Orwell's passion for the junk shop is comparable to basically a well-off person slumming it and saying, oh, you'll never guess what I found in the charity shop? Yeah. And this is why you don't like this essay? One of the reasons. Yeah. Coming from Mr. Blair, and knowing what we know of him and his background, yeah. Can you truly understand having to shop in a junk shop as opposed to him? He's very much like you. He finds it quite charming as a pastime as opposed to something he really has to do. I know he did live in poverty for some years, but it wasn't real poverty because he always had an escape route when he needed it. Well, yes, he did have his well-off parents. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I still think that... His love of junk shops is political, and I think, okay. I think that he believes that the junk shop is a place where I don't think I don't think that the junk shop subverts the capitalist system, but I think he believes the junk shop is a place where human beings can go to make their lives a bit more bearable in straitened times. And we know Orwell is all about humanity and the dignity of humanity. I think he sees... The Buying junk second-hand shop, junk. Useful stuff. Corkscrews, clock keys, skates, wine glasses, <laughs> copper saucepans and spare pram wheels. And also, you know, we, we, we mentioned, you know, when we were talking about the common toad, you know Orwell's um, thing about how we should take pleasure in human things and in the process yeah. of life. He says, the attraction of the junk shop, quoting Orwell, does not lie solely in the bargains you pick up, bargains important to people, uh, nor even in the aesthetic value, which at a generous estimate 5% of its contents may possess. <laughs> its appeal is to the jackdaw inside all of us, very human yeah. thing, the jackdaw inside all of us. 
The instinct that makes a child hoard copper nails, clock springs and the glass marbles out of lemonade bottles. To get pleasure out of a junk shop, you are not obliged to buy anything, nor even want to buy anything. Now, Simon, what is it people say about capitalism these days? It's that the problem with capitalism is that it's always encouraging you to buy a new thing. And yeah. when you buy that next thing, you'll be happy. Yeah. The junk shop doesn't do that. The junk shop lets you come in, wander around, maybe buy something, maybe not, but you'll still get pleasure out of it and you don't have to spend a penny. Just like when when we looked at Common Toad, you don't have to spend a penny True, to enjoy I'm, I'm with you on that one. We, we're living in Japan. Would you say Japan is the jackdaw capital of the world? Certainly a lot of hobbyists in Japan and collectors. But not just that, they won't throw stuff away. Mm. I think it's got the most second-hand shops per square mile in the world, Tokyo. I live up the road from a, a neighbourhood called Koenji, and it's basically a neighbourhood of second-hand shops. Yet Japan's possibly one of the most capitalist countries in the world, so where's the link there, do you think? I agree with what you just said. I thought that was, a very, I thought that was very eloquently put with that link to capitalism, but how would we explain that contradiction in Japan? Well, I suppose you could say that in a capitalist country, a lot of stuff gets thrown away because everyone's yeah. buying more stuff. And in Japan, of course, people don't really have much space in their homes, so they're constantly having to get rid of things. What, what, is it because there's nowhere to put all this old stuff, nowhere to throw it away, that they've right. developed this habit of... Yeah. Or is there something in Japanese culture going back you know, with like Confucianist principles that... Although that would be the case in China too, and in China nothing lasts for a week anymore. Well, maybe that's a legacy of the Cultural Revolution yeah. as well. Though. But do you think it goes back further, or do you think it is simply because of the lack of space in Japan to dispose of things? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that in you know we've become a disposable society, um, and if you look at the way people were living in the Edo period, they only had, they still lived in tiny spaces, but they only had the things they needed. And, you know, they only had one kimono and they wore it till it was rags. Um, it, isn't this like conversion of, or convolution of Shinto and Buddhism all about renewal? Which is why temples get, and shrines get torn down and rebuilt every now and then that's quite to right. represent renewal and the whole cycle of, of Buddhism. Yes, and the fact that Japanese Very houses, good. which are traditionally wooden, um, you know, after a while they just rot, so they do need to be pulled down and, and renewed. So it's, what happened to that element of their culture? And the, it's okay, it's a secular country, but their religious history to this Jack Dorish nature they have these days. Oh, it's, uh, have, you, have you been to many Japanese houses, contemporary, like of friends? I told you a story once in night when I visited uh, somebody's house, a Japanese person, and I couldn't believe how much just tat there was lying everywhere. This person would not throw stuff away, and it was just plastic bags hanging up everywhere full of various things. I was shocked. Well, Simon, have I converted you on this essay? You, you've got me thinking. I, I, what you, you put your argument across very well. And I, it, uh, well enough to deserve me reading this again and thinking about it from the point of view you've given me. Yeah. And uh, if any of li the listeners want to talk to us about useful objects such as corkscrews, clock keys, skates, wine glasses, <laughs> copper saucepans and spare pram wheels. And ostrich eggs. Or indeed... Uh, Ostrich eggs, typewriters, spectacles without lenses, decanters without stoppers, stuffed birds, <laughs> and pictures of Highland cattle. Uh, then... You'd be pissed off if you were the kid who had to paint the ostrich egg. <laughs> I mean, get, the, the, get the Sistine Chapel fresco on that. Nice callback. <laughs> get the Last Supper and Breakfast on, the, on an ostrich egg. <laughs> We're orwellpod at gmail.com. Please write to us. We're on all the podcast apps and also Instagram. Uh, all right. Thanks. And the podcast can be listened to again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. And again. Although we do produce a new one weekly. That was just junk, but who could resist it? Well, I thought it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're on a roll. Anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. And as we always say, what do we always say? So? Well, as you always say. As I always say. 
four wheel. That's